What's going on everyone? My name is Prerak. I'm an MD MBA student here at Yale and um, I have recently been doing a lot of mock interviews with individuals and I figured I would share the things that I'm learning with anyone who is applying for medical school right now. So today we will be talking about the questions that you will 100% be asked in your medical school interview, whether that's a behavioral interview or an MMI. All right, so let's start with the basics here. The fundamental aspect of any interview, whether that's in the MMI or the behavioral interview, is that at the end of the day, we are all humans, and an interview is still just a formal conversation. The goal is to convey your story, and at the end of the day, if I am interviewing you or if someone is interviewing you, they need to be able to see a little bit of themselves in you, and they also need to know who you are so they can go back to the admissions committee and have a one-line summary of who you are and advocate for you. So with that being said, there are some basic questions that almost everyone should be able to answer uh, because this will be asked at any interview you go to, such as, tell me about yourself. You need to have a, about a one and a half to two minute response telling people about yourself with the beginning, middle, and end of your story, how it brings you to medical school, how it brings you to the specific medical school you are applying to in that moment, and ultimately where you see yourself in the future. This question, I cannot tell you how underrated it is because it sets the entire guiding tone for the conversation. And I'm gonna give you an, another resource later on in this presentation to help you address it. But just remember, this question will be asked and it gives you a way to start guiding the conversation in the direction that you want it to go. The next three questions that you will almost inevitably be asked and therefore you should make sure you have good answers to are why medical school specifically as opposed to nursing school or PA school. There are so many careers in the health sciences that oftentimes individuals will be asked and they will often be pushed and stressed to say, okay, it seems like you wanna help people, that's great, but you can help people in a lot of different ways. Why specifically do you wanna be a doctor as opposed to a nurse or a PA? And that is something that you should make sure you have thought about uh, because it, it, I have seen it be um, the downfall for a lot of students. Uh, because I can say like, it seems like you love helping people, it seems like you love science, so why medical school specifically? Why didn't you want to do a PhD? Why didn't you want to become a nursing student? Something like that. So really, really make sure you understand that one. Next, the next two questions you want to make sure you understand is why this specific medical school and why you specifically. I also have questions, I also have videos on both of these subjects that I will link in the description below. The question about why you specifically is almost very similar to the diversity question a lot of schools ask in their essays. But this question can be a bit more subtle and you need to make sure you research the school before you actually go into that school. So that way you know a few things about that school that make it truly unique. With that being said, here's just one of the things that I'm going to link in the description below. I'm also going to link the diversity video I've made in the past to help you understand what schools may be looking for when they ask you why you specifically. But now I want to get into the meat of this presentation, which is going to talk about different types of questions you may be asked that you may not have anticipated. The first one is what I like to call the knowledge bank type of question. What is the knowledge bank type of question? Well, these are questions that are intended to gauge your opinions, thoughts, and knowledge on healthcare. By no means does anyone interviewing you expect you to be an expert on healthcare. We don't expect anyone to know what the ins and outs of Medicare, Medicaid, health insurance, or even like particular specialties of medicine are. But with that being said, we do expect a certain level of insight into healthcare that may actually be good uh, to have. For example, it would be really weird for someone who wanted to become an engineer to not know anything about engineering. Uh, it would be really weird for someone who wanted to go into medicine to not understand the fundamentals of medicine or at least have opinions on that matter. So with that being said, you may actually be asked some questions like what do you think the biggest problem in healthcare is? Where do you see healthcare in 10 years? If you could change anything in healthcare, what would it be and why? What are the pros and cons of a single payer system? The whole point of questions like this is to get your opinion. It's not to make sure you understand the every minute detail of healthcare, but it's to see that you've at least thought about them and understand that you're entering a system that's much larger than purely just treating patients one-on-one. -on -one. That's a huge part of the job, but a big part of your job is also understanding that there are big, big problems in the system and you need to come in with potential understanding of those problems. So the way you want to approach these questions is if they catch you off guard, it's okay to ask for 30 seconds to a minute to think about it. 
Very rarely will interviewers say, no, I want an answer right away. If someone asks you a question, like for example, what is the biggest problem in healthcare in your opinion? You can easily say like, wow, that's like a really deep question. Do you mind if I take 30 seconds to just think about it? Honestly, sometimes when students do that, I actually feel a little bit better about their answer because I feel like they're not just winging it and they're not just like going off the, the rehearsed answer they had. They're actually thinking pretty deeply about, okay, I acknowledge that this is a huge question and can have multiple answers. I'm going to think about it for a little bit. And then after you start, it's okay to acknowledge that you don't have all the answers. You may not know what a single payer healthcare system is, and that's fine. Acknowledge your shortcomings, but at the same time, at least provide an insight into like, okay, well, I don't know everything about the healthcare system, but I do know that there are certain pros and cons to single payer. And here's the general insights I've had based on my experience. Feel free to correct me if I'm mistaken about anything, any of these things, right? By putting yourself out there, again, you're, you're making big assertions, but you're doing it with the caveat that you understand and acknowledge you don't have all the answers. And the people who I've seen give me the best responses tend to be the people who pick one to two insights they have. So for example, they might say the biggest problem in healthcare is um, for example, the lack of coverage that you know people don't have. We don't have a universal coverage system. And here is why I think that. So they, they substantiate that belief with one or two points, but they often have their personal experiences substantiate that. So for example, they might say, I've done research in healthcare economics and I have seen that the top 2% of healthcare spending uh, accounts for almost 80 to 90% of the total spending overall. And by mentioning their research, they're showing me that like, oh shit, they actually have some insight into the issue and they also have done a work in this matter and that's why it's important to them. The point is not to be right, but it's to build a reasonable argument. So I just wanna make sure you understand that and understand that these are very likely things that you could be asked. The other thing I'm gonna bring up that could be brought up in your interview is this aspect of hypotheticals. These are questions that are intended to catch you a bit off guard and they're supposed to be things that you cannot prepare for. And with that being said, I'm gonna put them here to help you in the off chance that you actually do try to prepare for them because I think it's still important to understand that you may get questions that are intended to catch you off guard. These questions can be very, very, very uh, stressful. For, for example, I, I have a question I usually ask people I mock interview with. I ask them, hey, if a patient you have is diagnosed with HIV and you tell them that they have HIV and they tell them and they tell you that you don't, they don't want you to tell their wife because they think it's going to destroy their marriage, how do you react? And the whole point of this is to make sure the individual, I would tell the individual who I'm interviewing, HIV is a bloodborne illness. It's also sexually transmitted. So by not telling the wife, you may be putting her at risk. So how would you approach a situation like this? Another question may be uh, a minor under the age of 16 or 18 coming to you and, you know, let's say you're a hypothetical physician and they ask you for birth control. How do you approach a conversation like this? Um, I may also even ask you, for example, there are people who think healthcare is a privilege and there's people who think healthcare is a right. Give me two reasons why you think healthcare is a privilege or maybe not why you think. Give me two reasons why you think that someone might think healthcare is a privilege and then also give me two reasons why you think someone might think healthcare was a right. In each of these questions, I am trying to catch you off guard and again, it's okay to ask like, wow, this is a very like deep question. Do you mind if I take 30 seconds to think about it? At that point, I would say yes. And at that point, it's very important to remember that if it's an ethical situation, there's four aspects of ethics that you should probably go over. Autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, right? Doing good, doing no harm, making sure you're giving patient autonomy over their personal health records, and making sure you're treating everyone equally, as well as looking out for the patient's safety. That's one way to approach these hypothetical scenarios. And if you follow that general formula, you will do pretty well. But I will say, don't ever jump to extremes. There's never one right answer. It's never that the person who has HIV should never tell their partner. It's also that you should allow them to do, it's also probably not that you should allow them to do whatever they want because there are repercussions. The answer is likely somewhere in the middle. Similarly, when I ask you to give me what you think someone who believes healthcare is a privilege is thinking, or what you think someone who believes healthcare is a right is thinking, I am asking you to take the perspectives of both of these individuals and put yourself out of the situation. The point of these stressful situations is to understand that you're going to be placed in um, scenarios where you may not agree with the patient and you may not 
fully empathize with them, but you're still expected to care for them in an objective manner. So the point here is to make sure you take a deep breath, take both sides, understand the pros and cons, and show me that you're really thinking through what the patient might be feeling. And oftentimes the best answers that I get are not the ones that have all of the right details, but they're usually the ones that I feel are the most humane. And they approach this person with like a genuine um, empathetic attitude. So with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, drop a like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.